Next on the news, New York's newest adoration chapel County blessed by the Bishop of Brooklyn, an exclusive look at a year's worth of renovations. Then the city's crisis, we hear from the migrants themselves why they are contradicting the mayor. And they're coming here, but Americans are heading south. I grew up in New York. LA. Atlanta, Georgia. To Mexico, what's motivating that migration? And things have gotten so bad in Hollywood, the city is handing out date rape test kits to bar goers. Plus, Kirk Cameron, he joins us to talk about a new pro-life movie. I think heaven timed this. Why it's here, just in time. I'm Christine Persichetti. Currents News starts right now. It's a new beginning for a church in the Diocese of Brooklyn that was ravaged by Hurricane Ida. Last year's deadly storm swept in and flooded out the lower church and Adoration Chapel at St. Mary's Winfield in Woodside. After months of repairs, it's been reopened and rededicated. The forces of nature are strong, but the power of God is stronger. Bishop Robert Brennan referring to the force of nature that destroyed the Adoration Chapel and Lower Church at St. Mary's Winfield in Woodside, Queens last September. Lower Church is now completely flooded. Fast forward almost a year. We ask you now to bless us. And that Lower Church and Adoration Chapel were rededicated on Monday night by the Bishop of Brooklyn, who then celebrated Mass in the main church. We're not destroyed by a storm, by a flood. Oh, yeah, it can knock us off our feet a little while. It can make things a little uncomfortable for a while. But we make all things new in Christ Jesus our Lord. The pastor, Father Christopher O'Connor, remembers when Hurricane Ida tore through the city on September 1st. And then the water just blew the door off the boiler, the boiler room door, and then it stopped cascading in, and within two hours, like 10 feet of water inside the church. So this is insane. The chapel was pretty new then. It had only been open about seven months, but the grief Father O'Connor felt after losing this sacred space soon turned to joy. After Currents News reported on the devastation, I'm glad my people were crying this morning. The story went national and the donations came pouring in from all over the country. $100,000 came from parishioners alone. The cleanup began right after the flood, then the repairs. And while work is still being done, Father O'Connor just posted these before and after pictures on his Facebook page to show everyone the fruits of their donations. He says he's grateful for it, and he's grateful for the bishop's visit and blessing. He um, kind of reminded us, uh, uh, you know, even though the flood didn't have the final victory, you know, and we were back. Father O'Connor says he's now on a mission to make the new chapel a place for perpetual adoration. He's hoping within the next couple of months to have it open 24 seven. Also tonight, the stories behind thousands of miles. We hear from the immigrants arriving by the bus load. They want to go in these buses. Right now on Currents News, New York City's migrant crisis. The numbers are doubling by the week. Thousands of people hopping off buses at Port Authority with nowhere to stay. The mayor says that Texas is forcing the migrants onto buses as a political ploy. But now we are hearing from the new arrivals themselves. Currents News Melissa Corsi has the story. These migrants at this shelter in Eagle Pass, Texas, have all just crossed the Rio Grande from Mexico into Texas, surrendered to the U.S. Border Control received future immigration court dates and are about to board this bus for a 1700 mile ride to Washington DC, a plan started by the Texas governor in April. Some people say it's cruel, but this story may not be what you would expect. They want to go in these buses. Valeria Wheeler is the executive director of Mission Border Hope, a nonprofit organization rooted in the United Methodist Church. They serve this border community in Eagle Pass and operate this shelter for the recent arrivals. She's aware of the political component to the long bus rides, but says many of these people want to go to Washington or New York. No one has been forced. About 500 people come to the shelter daily. 
many with family in the United States. But other people, like 28-year-old Genesis Figueroa from Venezuela, have no family in the country. But she traveled a month and a half by foot, bus and boat, to get here. She says, I got very tired, my legs hurt, and I got sick. I came down with pneumonia. I was hospitalized for three days in Guatemala. Genesis says she and her husband have been on the road for so long, we don't mind two or three more days. She's headed to Washington. She has friends there. Cousins Luis Pulido and Ainer Garrido took six weeks to get here from Venezuela. And then something horrible happened. Luis says this trip took his younger brother's life. Luis's brother Juan disappeared when they were all swimming across the Rio Grande. Shelter officials had just informed him Juan's body was found. He had drowned. The time has come for the bus to leave. Genesis Figueroa gets processed by members of the Texas State Guard, and so do cousins Luis Pulido and Ainer Garrido. And then 41 men, women and children come out in the blazing sunshine to board the bus for the 40-hour ride. Each passenger we talk to saying they appreciate getting this air-conditioned bus ride to what they hope is a much better road ahead. Melissa Corsi, Currents News. The migrants we met in Melissa's story also say they have a plan for the future. Genesis says she hopes to support her family back in Venezuela by cleaning, cooking or doing office work. Luis and Einer say they'd like to help their families by working in the restaurant business. Let's take a closer look now at the numbers of migrants arriving in New York City. According to the Mayor's Office of Immigrant Affairs, roughly 6,300 migrants have arrived in the city from the southern border since May. On average, about 100 migrants have been dropped off daily outside the Port Authority bus terminal since the first charter bus from, Me from Texas showed up. New York City's Mayor Eric Adams has been calling for federal assistance to handle the influx of migrants all summer, even when the numbers were much smaller. Shortly after the first bus of migrants from Texas arrived in the city, he urged the federal government to step up, saying the surge of migrants is making it difficult for the city to fulfill its legal obligation to provide housing to those in need. Despite the surge in New York, U.S. Customs and Border Protection is set to break a record for expulsions. At the moment, the number of apprehensions at the southern border has hit the 1.9 million mark so far this year. And if things continue the way they are, then that number should pass 2 million by the end of September. And this might be surprising, but at the same time, the number of Americans crossing the border in the opposite direction has been on the rise. I grew up in New York. L.A. Atlanta, Georgia. Americans who have been working from home during the pandemic have flooded the streets of Mexico City in search of a cheaper cost of living. According to the State Department, 1.6 million Americans are now living in Mexico. However, for the locals there, it's become an issue as landlords have increased rent and evicted longstanding tenants to accommodate new, higher-paying residents. Americans essentially gentrifying Mexico City. I think there was a sense of we want people to come here to stimulate the economy. Thank you for being here. But I know that recently there's been um, kind of complaints from locals about the effect that expats living here has had on their own um, lifestyles. This is part of the problem, he says. The expats move here because it's cheap, not because they want to truly immerse in the local culture. According to Mexico's Secretary of Tourism, the country's economy is on track to surpass pre-pandemic levels as tourism from U.S. travelers have generated over $11 billion in revenue for Mexico. Back to New York now, six New York City firefighters are in the hospital after battling an early morning fire in Williamsburg. The multi-alarm fire broke out at about 3.30 Tuesday in a building with a restaurant and some apartments. It was brought under control a couple of hours later, but the cause is still under investigation, and we still don't know how those firefighters are doing. Also in Williamsburg, two disturbing attacks that happened within minutes of each other. Two Jewish men were sprayed with a fire extinguisher Sunday, and police are now investigating it as a hate crime. Footage shows an attacker blasting a 72-year-old man dressed in traditional Hasidic clothing. In the second incident, a 66-year-old man was sprayed and then beaten. 
A United Nations diplomat is accused of raping one of his neighbors in Upper Manhattan over the weekend, but he's free because of diplomatic immunity. Charles Oliha was arrested on Sunday after being accused of following a woman into her apartment and attacking her. Aliha was taken into custody, but he invoked his diplomatic status and was released. Immunity can only be waived by the government of the official's home country. A representative for the embassy of South Sudan hasn't commented on the incident, and it remains unclear what legal actions the city might consider taking. There's a lot more news headed your way. You've heard of free COVID tests, but what about free date rape kits? Why one California city needs to hand them out as a precaution. Plus this. Three brown stars and I got a presidential unit citation. He's a decorated war hero with no plans of slowing down the journey he made to get to this point. And following footsteps made long, long ago, how a severe drought in Texas uncovered a little piece of history. There are now some big changes to the tablet website. You can get personalized access to the Catholic news you value. Sign up for free at thetablet.org. The city of West Hollywood is stepping up safety measures, giving people at bars and restaurants a new tool to help them know if their drink has been spiked. The strips are designed to detect date rape type drugs. So all users have to do is put a drop of their drink onto the strip to make sure it's safe. The plan comes after the city saw a spike in sexual violence. Between 2016 and 2021, a report came out in January uh, that there were uh, 30 sexual assaults tied to drink spiking incidents in the city of West Hollywood, and only three of those have cases filed with the DA. The city handed out a total of 2,500 test kits, and now they're thinking of creating a sexual assault task force, as well as a mobile unit to help potential victims. Increasing violence is also a growing concern in New York. For the second time in two months, New Yorkers are voting in primary races, this time for Congress and the state Senate. But most from the Big Apple don't expect any changes, that is, anytime soon. Even though there are several competitive primaries today that could change the course of the city and the state, experts are predicting that people just won't get out the vote. It's a rare August primary, so many people are distracted or away. Turnout is expected to be even lower than it usually is. Only 3% of the city's eligible voters casted their ballots early. Also tonight, this story of survival. We came to this country, and my, between my mother and I, we had seven bucks in our pocket. Robert Schweiger's journey to America, it's a miracle he made it. But he did, and now he's 101 years old. Robert's seen some of the worst parts of history, the Holocaust, World War II. Still, as Wendy Lane reports, the centenarian believes he has had a beautiful life. And now he wants to tell you his secrets so you can have one too. You're never going to amount to anything looking for a free lunch. Robert Schweiger knows the value of hard work. He enjoys cooking dinner each night after spending the day doing options trading. What is your age? 71. I mean, not 71. I was born in 1921. That makes me 101. And him making it to this ripe old age is a miracle all on its own. That's when we arrived in America. Robert is a Holocaust survivor, but many on his Jewish family tree were not as fortunate. Erwin, see, that's my brother. He got killed in the concentration camp. He and his family escaped Austria when he was 16, eventually making it to the Detroit area. We came to this country, and my, between my mother and I, we had seven bucks in our pocket. But just a few years after finding refuge on American soil, Robert was drafted into World War II sent back to the land he escaped from, facing death yet again as one of the first groups to arrive to Normandy on D-Day. We were dug in on the beach at Omaha Beach, I remember, you know, take the shovel, dig in a little bit. You swear that that plane that you see up there can see you in that foxhole. The highly decorated World War II hero 
escaping Europe with his life for a second time. Three brown stars and I got a presidential unit citation. Before moving to Bradenton in the 70s, Robert became a successful businessman in the Detroit auto industry. He had a family and was happily married to his sweetheart for 78 years until she passed away just a few years ago. I still miss her just terribly. They say it's going to get a little better, but it really doesn't get better. You know, she was part of my life, you know. Despite his loss, this World War II hero Holocaust survivor and refugee knows something about perseverance. And the secret to Robert's successful and fruitful life, he says, is simple. Work hard and... Don't drink any cheap booze. That'll do you in. What an amazing guy. That was Wendy Lane reporting. Robert says living in this country is a gift he has never taken for granted. Now to something much older than Robert. The severe drought in Texas has uncovered a little piece of history. You're looking at dinosaur tracks from about 113 million years ago, exposed when a river dried out in Dinosaur Valley State Park. A park official says these tracks likely came from a dino that weighed seven tons and was 15 feet tall. The tracks are going to be covered up again as the forecast is calling for rain. Park officials say that's a good thing because the water helps protect the prints from disappearing. Wow. Still to come on Currents News, a sitcom star turned faith-based film actor. This movie uh, is, is able to shape the hearts and minds on the topic. Kirk Cameron joins us to talk about his newest project, a pro-life movie that tells a true story about the blessings of adoption. Do you have a story idea or want to share a tip? Email us at newstips at desalesmedia.org or call our 24-hour number 718-517-3122. We'll be right back. a gift and you will always be our son. I've always wondered if my biological parents think about me. I don't think he'd want to talk to me. There's only one way to find out. Is that your birth mom? She wants to meet. A true story about adoption, discovery, and forgiveness. This pro-life movie is about to hit theaters. Now, you may remember Kirk Cameron from the 1980s sitcom Growing Pains. Well, now the actor is well known for his faith and family focused films like this new one he's starring in. Life Mark will hit the big screen in a couple of weeks. Kirk Cameron, who is also the movie's executive producer, joins us now to tell us all about it. Hi, Kirk. Christine, it's so nice to see you. Thanks for having me on your program. It's great to have you here. Now, this movie has pretty good timing. It was just two months ago when the Supreme Court overturned Roe v. Wade. Tell us a little bit about that and, and why it's important that stories like this one are told. The timing of Life Mark is unbelievable. I mean, who would have thought in our lifetime that Roe versus Wade would be gone and right on the heels of that Supreme Court decision, a movie would come into the theaters that celebrates life and the beauty of adoption. And this was in our doing. I think heaven timed this because we actually made Life Mark two and a half years ago. We've been working on it, but the, the release was delayed because of COVID. Uh, actually, I think the delay is right on time uh, because this is the moment where we as the family of faith can make a massive impact for life. This movie uh, is is able to shape the hearts and minds on the topic. Absolutely, and now you play the father who adopted the baby in this film, and I know you can relate because in real life, you and your wife adopted four children before having two biological children. So tell us why you decided to adopt and, and why it's such a blessing. So my wife, Chelsea, uh, who played my girlfriend on Growing Pains. <laughs> she and I have been married now for 31 years and we have six children and we adopted our first four kids. So when I think about the most important people in my life, as an adoptive father, my first four babies were one doctor appointment away from not existing. 
They came uh, as, as the result of an unplanned pregnancy. And my wife is also an adopted child. She was this close to not being here. And if my wife hadn't been born, either would our two natural born children have been born. So my whole family exists because of those who love and defend and cherish the value of life in the womb. As an adoptive father, uh, I, I couldn't be more grateful. Uh, and as an actor, I couldn't be more excited because Life Mark is um, another Kendrick Brothers movie. I got to make it together with them and act in it with Alex Kendrick. So this is the first movie we have done together since Fireproof. And if you loved War Room and if you loved Courageous and Overcomer, you've got to see Life Mark because uh, it will make you laugh and cry. It's got humor and action. It's uh, got something for the whole family. All right, let's talk about your career for a second here. You've, you've been focusing your career on faith-based films like this one. Why is that so important to you? And we're all wondering, have you turned down offers to act in more mainstream movies to kind of stick to your beliefs? Some people, that's a great question. And some people think that I, I willingly walked away from Hollywood. Well, I still, I'm still here, I still live here. And in fact, the boundaries of Hollywood have expanded uh, to small towns all over the world. Now that we have iPhones and we have high technology equipment, we can make movies and we can create parallel industries and we can actually recreate the art of storytelling to reflect the values that we love and cherish. So for me, it comes down to pursuing the projects that resonate in my heart and in my mind. And as, uh, as a Christian, as a father, and as uh, a, an American patriot, I want to make movies that celebrate and reinforce the values that made this country the greatest nation in the history of the world. The strongest, the freest, the most blessed, and the most generous, sending the gospel out to more places on the planet than anyone else. And I want us to keep that for our kids and for our kids' kids. So, so that's why I make movies that are based and rooted in, uh, in the faith that built America. So what do you hope people will take away from this film? Well, if you come see Life, Mark, uh, you'll see that this is a story about the agony of one young woman's choice for what's best for her and for her child. Uh, the joy of a young couple just starting out their family and the journey of a young man who is on a search for where his life began. And I think you're going to come out uh, with your heart enlarged 10 times uh, for the value of life and you're gonna see adoption as this beautiful gift from God. Well, I for one cannot wait to watch this movie. Kirk Cameron, actor and executive producer of Life Mark, thanks so much for joining us. Thanks for having me on, God bless you. The film Life Mark will be in select theaters from September 9th through the 15th. To learn more about the movie or to get tickets near you, just go to lifemarkmovie.com. And finally, it's a story of hope and healing. Two years ago, Houston police officer Jason Knox passed away in a helicopter crash. And ever since, his law enforcement family promised to look after his wife and children with care. Well, it's a promise they kept as Jason's daughter Eliza Knox got ready to attend her first day of kindergarten. A convoy complete with a helicopter flyby saw the young girl onto the bus and escorted her all the way to school. This isn't the only major milestone the police department hopes to attend. They're also planning to show up to Eliza's high school graduation. Oh, that's sweet. And that is Currents News. I'm Christine Persichetti. Thank you for joining us because we are putting your faith in the news. Hope to see you again next time.